Well, good morning, everybody. My name's David. I'm one of the pastors here. And can I add my very warm welcome to you all? It's lovely to see you all here at City Church this morning for our second service, particularly if you're a visitor. You're so welcome. It's great to have you with us. And I hope you've been having a good week. Now, I don't know if you've noticed what an open spiritual climate we live in at the moment, which feels something really new to me. People are much more open to Jesus. And it's very different from when I was first exploring faith, which was over 40 years ago. But I think COVID shook people's faith in the sort of natural things. And so many people are looking for answers. And that makes it just a great time for us to be sharing Jesus with people. On Wednesday, I popped into our corner shop and I got chatting to the guy at the counter. And I find anywhere a sort of month either side of Christmas or Easter, it's just very easy to open up a spiritual conversation. So I asked him if he'd had a good Easter, and he said yes. And he then has a choice. He can ask me about my Easter or not. And he did. He said, did you have a good Easter? And so I just tell him the truth. I say, yeah, we had a great Easter. It was lovely to see family and friends. And I love being at church on Easter Sunday. I so love celebrating the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Now, he has another choice. He can say, £7.50, please. Or he can say something more pertinent to what I've just said. And he said, oh, that's interesting. I'm not a Christian, but I am open. So I asked him his name, and his name is Steve. So why don't you tell your neighbor, Steve is open to Jesus? You know, there's a Steve living in the house next to you, and there's one on the desk opposite you at work. There's a Steve in your gym. There's a Steve at your school gate. We are surrounded by Steves who are open to Jesus. There are literally thousands and thousands of Steves in our city who are open to Jesus. And that's why I'm so thrilled we're doing this new series on work. You know, before I left Steve, I shared my 15-second testimony with him. And this is something you can find online. If you're not very good at sharing your faith, I found it so helpful. It's a bit like if you're learning to play the piano and you're not very good, you learn your scales and arpeggios. You don't want to do those all the time, but it gives you a really good foundation for then doing more complicated things. So I shared my 15-second testimony, which just says a bit about what Jesus has done in my life. We smiled, he said something else, it was great, and then I left. So next time I'm in the shop, I'm going to be looking out for Steve again. And our series is called Fruitful, Work, Rest, and the Glory of God. And you've probably realized that the most important things in your life don't happen in Christian meetings. It's simple mathematics, isn't it? Two hours here a week, 166 hours out there. And it's out there in the workplace the home, the college and neighborhood that God's kingdom advances. So this series, so this week and next week, Kate and I are going to be talking about how we can all be fruitful at work. And then in week three, James will be focusing on rest and refreshment and how we can actually live sustainable lives in our crazy 24-7 technological world. Now this is for all of us because work isn't just what we're paid to do. We all have work to do, whether paid or not. So prepare to be inspired, encouraged, challenged, and refreshed. And we're defining work for this series as all the productive things we do with our time. Okay? So to expand that a bit, it could be paid work, it could be voluntary work, it could be looking after children or an elderly relative. It's whatever we do with our time most of the week when we're not in Christian meetings, wherever we're hoping to be fruitful. And there's so many of you who are out there serving us in the city, being fruitful in amazing ways. So let me just introduce you to a few of the amazing people at City Church. Firstly, this is Sally. Hey, Sally has this amazing job for Newcastle City Council helping communities prevent violence against women and girls. You know, every day, Sally is out there serving us in that amazing way. Next, we've got Alan. Alan has two great jobs. He creates beautiful uh, pictures. He's an artist, portraits, landscapes, and also he helps ex-offenders to find work and training. He's bringing life and hope in those two ways. Next, we've got Trinette. 
Yeah, oh man, yeah, Trinette uh, isn't paid, she's a student, she's studying pharmacy, and you know, pharmacists are becoming more and more critical to our health, and Trinette loves sitting with people, loving them, and helping ensure they get the right treatment. Now John and Gladys. Now John, hey, yeah, amen, yeah. <laughs> I just want to say, don't say this to the people at the first service, but you guys are more responsive, you're definitely better. <laughs> Um, John and Gladys are retired, but they are the most productive people I know. Their lives are filled with service, hospitality, prayer, and acts of kindness. If you're retired or unemployed and you don't know what to do with your time, speak to John and Gladys. They're a great model to follow. Next, we've got Anna. Anna's a businesswoman. She's got this amazing business which provides bouncy castles and outdoor toys for parties for kids and for grown-ups. And, you know, we need small businesses, don't we, with Christ-like values. That's so good. And then finally, for now, we've got Elijah. Elijah's, yeah, a senior sales executive. He sells perfumes and cosmetics on the road. You know, Elijah's the sort of guy you just want to buy stuff from. He's authentic, he's joyful, and he's full of the Spirit of God. So just a small cross-section. We've got Sally, Alan, Trinette, John and Gladys, Anna, Elijah. Just a cross-section of the amazing people serving us in the city every day. And we want to equip you all to do it even more fruitfully because we know the city won't be transformed by what happens in here, but out there on a Monday morning when you're creating beautiful products and doing it for the glory of God. On a Tuesday afternoon when you have an ethical decision to make in the workplace. On a Wednesday home time when you decide to stay behind to help a colleague who's struggling with mental health. Now, I've had loads of jobs over the years. I've cleaned toilets, I've worked in a factory, I've written software on chemical plants. Currently, I have some part-time jobs working to make our seas sustainable and fisheries, uh, working for a housing association, and I volunteer here and in other ways as well. And you know, work has given me some of my toughest experiences. Unemployment. When I uh, left college, I was unemployed. And the worst thing was the worry, you know, will I get a job next week, next month, next year, ever? The shame of thinking, well, I've got these qualifications. What's wrong with me that nobody will employ me? And the confusion, you know, God, you've called me to stay in the Northeast. Why haven't you given me a job? After six months, I got a job cleaning, and it was such a good job. And I, I worked with some amazing people, and it was just great to have some work to do. I've been incompetent in the workplace. One time I worked in a factory and I managed to get the jib of a crane stuck in the door of this machine and it wrenched it into this horrible shape. And my boss came over and his language indicated he wasn't best impressed with me. Works exposed the flaws in my character. Just the other week I was in a meeting where everybody knew far more than I did. And I was asked a question I, I didn't know the answer to. I tried to pretend I did and I sort of waffled and... You know, I thought, why didn't I just tell the truth and say, I don't know? I've been bored in the workplace, I've been bullied in the workplace, I've been stressed in the workplace, and I've been disappointed. And yet, I've also seen God working through it all to achieve amazing things in my lives, in the business I've worked for, and in the community. And that's why I'm calling this talk, God at Work. And that's summarized beautifully in Philippians 2, verse 13, which says this, It is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Tell somebody this, God is at work in your work. And so what we want to do now is offer up all our work, the good, the bad, and the ugly, all our struggles to God in a moment of sacrifice and prayer. So let's pray. You might want to name a specific work issue that's facing you right now. <clears throat> Father, you're at work in us and we offer you our work, whatever that is. We bring it before you as a sacrifice and say, Lord, would you speak to us? Would you change us? Would you make us more fruitful? In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible gives us three main headings to think about work, creation, incarnation, resurrection. Creation speaks of the original goodness of work and how we can create beautiful culture. 
incarnation, which is Jesus coming down into our world of sin and pain and mess, speaks of the suffering and sacrifice of work. And resurrection, Jesus' resurrection from the dead and our future resurrection gives us hope for the future. Now, if you were to start searching through your Bible, say, I wonder what the Bible says at work. The good news is you don't have to go very far. Chapter 1, verse 1 of Genesis, the first book, says this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Isn't that amazing? Work is the very first thing mentioned in the Bible. And let's just read a few more verses of Genesis together. Let's read this together. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good. And he separated the light from the darkness. So God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And there was evening. There was morning the first day. So God takes something formless and he creates these beautiful things. And if you read through the whole chapter, you see the original goodness of work so powerfully. God makes the land produce crops. He creates beautiful animals. He fills the sky with light, all out of the overflowing love in his heart. And you get to the end of chapter one and that whole amazing work of initial creation is summarized like this. Verse 31, God saw, that all he had, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. So it's so important to recognize this, that work begins with perfection, with everything beautiful, everything satisfying. And that's actually a very radically different view of work to many cultures. For example, the Greek culture of work is based on something called Pandora's box, where Pandora opens a box and that's where all the bad things come from. All this stuff comes flying out of the box and infects the world. Misery and war and suffering and death. And work. So work is seen as something fundamentally bad. So in Greek culture, you wanted to be a philosopher and rise above work and have a slave class who would do all the menial stuff while you just sat and thought beautiful thoughts. And actually, that sort of attitude to work is common in our culture. Just the other day, somebody said to me, oh, well, a bad day on the golf course is better than a good day in the office. And actually, that's not a biblical view of work. So God finishes the initial creation, and then he passes on the responsibility for developing that to human beings. He says this, let us make man in our image, in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. This is our mandate for the workplace, to be fruitful, to increase, to fill the earth and to rule. God makes us stewards of his creation. We're given authority to fill the earth with glory on God's behalf. So for us humans, work didn't arrive after the golden age. Work in God's kingdom is the golden age. And we're uniquely placed to steward God's creation because we're this amazing blend of spirit and matter. So God is spirit, the angels are spirit. You've got all the animals and creatures and the material world. But we're this in amazing fusion of the two. And you see this in chapter 2 of Genesis, verse 7 which describes the creation from a different perspective. The Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. So you have the dust and God breathing in his spirit, and we're that fusion of the two. So we are uniquely called to bring the spiritual into the material world. And this whole idea is called the cultural mandate from God, that God has given us workplaces, homes, neighborhoods to fill with culture, life, and beauty, acts of goodness to reflect him, to make amazing products, 
to write beautiful things, to provide sacrificial services, and to care for the poor. And you could summarize that whole cultural mandate in two words. You could say justice and mercy, grace and truth, integrity and compassion. Now, question. Does your workplace reflect the integrity and compassion of God? Maybe it does a bit, maybe it doesn't. But what an opportunity for us as Christians to bring that culture into the places we work. I'll give you an example from my own life. Um, some years ago, I was sitting reading the Bible one evening in the book of Daniel. And I was really struck by this guy, Daniel, who's like prime minister to the most powerful man on the earth at the time. And he treats this king, Nebuchadnezzar, who's a bit of a tyrant, with tremendous honor and courtesy and respect. And you think, is he a bit of a creep? But then as you read on, you discover he's also got this flawless integrity. And if ever he's asked to do something that contradicts the law of God, he will say no, even if it's going to cost him his own life. And I was thinking, wow, how can you have such courtesy and compassion and kindness and such integrity at the same time in the workplace? Lord, please make me that sort of person at work. And it's obviously a dangerous prayer to pray because... God tends to answer prayers sometimes, and he certainly answered this one, because the very next day I was in the kitchen making myself a cup of tea, and my boss came in, and he said, David, I want you to get me this data on this company. And I had a slightly odd job in that I was head of IT, and I was providing IT and data services to my own company, but also to some other companies as well, and I'd sign confidentiality agreements with them to, so that I'd protect their data. So I said to my boss, I said, well, Jim, yeah, I'd love to do that. I'll need to speak to them first. I don't think there'll be any problem. I just need to make sure they are happy to let you see their data. He said, no, 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 no. I don't want you to speak to them. I just want their data. And I thought, ah, Daniel. So I said, yeah, absolutely, Jim. Yeah, I want to get you this data. But do you remember, we signed a confidentiality agreement. You know, my signature's on it. I would need to speak to them to check. I don't want you to speak to them. Get me that data. And it became a sort of verbal tennis match where he was smashing the ball over the net at me and I was sort of flicking it back over the net to him and then smash it at me again. And in the end, he stormed out of the kitchen furious and without the data. And I went back to my office and I laughed hysterically for about 15 seconds. And then I was just overwhelmed with gratitude to God. Thank you, Lord, that I was just reading that last night, that you prepared me for this moment, and that I didn't compromise or disobey you. And actually, I had an excellent relationship with my boss ever after that. It was annoying for him that I wouldn't go behind other people's back, but I guess at least he knew I wouldn't go behind his back either. And one of the ways I think about our workplaces is it's like a field. And there's a guy called Boaz in the book of Ruth who has a field where he's responsible for. And it's the time of the judges. And if you back up and read the few chapters before Ruth, you discover it's an appalling time of criminality, sexual violence, and murder. And yet when you step into Boaz's field, it's a different world. Women are treated with respect. Uh, refugees are treated with respect, not just by Boaz, but by his whole team. And you see, Boaz has resolved, I can't control everything that happens out there, but in my field, in my sphere of responsibility, things are going to be done God's way. So what's your field at work? You might say, well, I don't manage anybody. No, but you still have a field. You still have an area of responsibility. And you can covenant with God and say, Lord, in my field, things are going to be done your way. It's going to be a culture of integrity and compassion. So creation shows us how we can create beautiful culture in the workplace. And then incarnation shows us how we can serve others. The Bible is very realistic about the pain and difficulty of work. In Genesis chapter 3, after uh, Adam and Eve have rejected God, he curses work and he says this, Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. So what's work like now? Well, it's painful toil. 
its thorns, its thistles, its sweat, its dust. Crops fail due to drought, prices rise and the poor go hungry. Ransomware brings companies to their knees. Factories are used to create bombs and guns. Bosses make themselves rich and don't give their workers fair pay. Lying and cheating and cruelty abound. And into that wicked world, God comes himself in the form of his son, Jesus. God enters our world as two cells fused together in Mary's womb. He honors the work of pregnancy and labor and childbirth. Jesus is born in the normal way of blood and pain and agony. He's breastfed. His mum and stepdad experience all the normal struggles of parenting. And he grows up to do a normal job as a carpenter, first as an apprentice to his father, then running the business himself. So imagine if you were one of his customers. Imagine if you had a chair made by Jesus. Wouldn't that be amazing? I mean, how much would that go for on eBay today, do you think? It would break all records. But you know, Jesus had bad customers who came back and said, I don't like this chair. You've not varnished it right. The nails aren't in the right place. You fool, don't you realize you've got a chair made by Jesus? But you know, for him, it was just like, um, like doing a normal job and getting all the sort of, uh, of problems that we face at work. So Jesus makes furniture. Then he enters into his ministry. He feeds the hungry. He heals the sick. And he washes his disciples' feet. So what does worker service look like for us? Well, the first person I think of is my son, Sam. So my son, Sam, works in IT support for the BBC. Now, if you are a producer or research assistant or journalist, and you get Sam Lyle when you have an IT problem, you are blessed. What will you get? Well, firstly, he won't treat you like an idiot. You'll get courtesy. You'll get clarity of explanation. You'll get total professionalism and persistence to see the job through to a solution. You know, when we provide Christ-like service in the workplace, it's a beautiful thing. My book recommendation for this series is Tim Keller's wonderful book, Every Good Endeavor by, it's by Tim Keller. It's on the bookstall. It's a brilliant overview of the world of work. And he tells a story of a local guy where he lives in New York who's the doorman of an apartment block. And he says this, Mike's been a doorman for 20 years and it's much more than a job to him. He cares about the people in the building and takes pride in helping them with loading, finding parking spaces, welcoming guests. He sets the standard for keeping the lobby clean and attractive. When he's asked what makes him drop what he's doing to get to the curb in time to help unload a customer's car, he says, that's my job. They needed help. Why does he remember the name of every child? Well, because they live here. He works out of gratitude for the job and for his life. He's glad to be in this country and for the opportunities it's given him. Now, most of the people Mike serves are professionals who are glad not to be doorman, but Mike's attitude shows that he recognizes the dignity of the work he is doing and he brings out its goodness and worth. You see, all kinds of work are honorable to God when they're done to his glory. Did you notice when we read about God creating Adam, God gets his hand in the dirt. He gets dirt under his fingernails. You can see Jesus in the carpenter shop inhaling sawdust and getting really mucky. So who can you serve in your work this week? Who can you demonstrate the sacrificial love of God to this week? We thought about work as creating amazing culture. We thought briefly about work as service. And finally, work as bringing hope. Jesus' resurrection from the dead gives us such good news of hope to proclaim. And with today's mental health epidemic, nothing is needed more in your workplace and mine than hope. Because we know that Jesus comes down, 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 through the agony of death on the cross and comes out the other side, bodily resurrected, never to die again. That's our indestructible hope to share with others. He goes to the very depths of the worst thing that could ever happen, the perfect son of God being crucified. And through his resurrection, the glorious triumph, seated at the right hand of God where he's going to make everything new. Every human experience, however dark and evil, fits within that vast range. And so we can have hope 
in every circumstance, and we can share that with others. Jesus puts it like this in John 11. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. So because that evil was overcome by Jesus' resurrection, we have hope for the worst in our world, both for change now and also we look for the day when Jesus wipes away every tear from our eyes. And we sing of that, don't we, in our meetings. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. I'm still waiting for the call from Ken to join the band, but it hasn't happened yet. Your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life. And, you know, the reason we sing songs like that in here is so that we can then go and share that with others out there. You know, I used to almost think somehow I wasn't really allowed to talk about Jesus at work. But actually, that's complete nonsense. It's a lie from the devil. Now, obviously, there are some professional relationships where we can't or there are restrictions and we need to honor those. But there's no rule that says you can't talk to your work colleagues, your friends and your neighbors about Jesus. We're Christians. Of course, we're going to talk about the one we love the most and the one who's the most important person in the world to us. And maybe you've never talked openly about your faith or you found that hard. I find simply declaring the name of Jesus changes everything. And there's a great verse in 1 Peter that's really helped me with thinking about sharing this message of hope. Peter says this in 1 Peter 3.15, In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have and do this with gentleness and respect. So yes, Jesus is Lord in my heart, but he's not meant to stay there. I'm to be ready to share him with others and always with gentleness and respect. So question for you to ask the person next to you. Are you ready to give a reason for the hope that is in you? Now, um, Mondays is my favorite day of the week because I think Mondays are a bit of an open goal, aren't they? What did you do at the weekend? I mean, there's so many great ways we can answer that. Well, church was great on Sunday. I love worshipping Jesus. And Newcastle won 4-0. Or we had baptisms, three people baptized on Sunday. I love hearing stories about how Jesus has changed people's lives. Or, yeah, I had a great weekend. I love church. Every week, new people are turning up wanting to know about Jesus. We're surrounded by people who are hungry for God. I was away on a work event with one of my boards earlier this week, and we had a dinner in the evening. And I got chatting to one of my colleagues about spiritual things, and we talked about Jesus. I asked her for her views on Jesus. She asked me for my story. And we actually had different views on him, but it was a great, warm, and open conversation. And you see, Jesus didn't just stay hidden in my heart. He came out and sat at the table with us at the board dinner, and he joined in the conversation. Now, because I am a bit of a natural coward, I've set myself this personal target. I want to bring hope to somebody every day. So in the morning, I pray that I'll have an opportunity. And for me, it's always to say the name of Jesus. That's always my touch point. You know, I honestly cannot remember the last time I got a negative response. Um, on Friday, I was in Tesco's. I probably spend too much time in supermarkets, but, but there you go. I got chatting to Chris at the checkout who said he'd had a bad back for weeks. And I knew I should offer to pray for him. So I said, do you believe in the power of prayer? He said, no, I don't believe any of that. And I thought, wasn't that a bad question to ask him? But I wasn't put off because I just sensed God wanted me to pray for him. So I said, well, I believe in the power of prayer. Can I pray for you? He said, yeah, sure. And you don't have long because there's the next person in the queue. So I said, Lord Jesus, I pray for Chris. Pray you'd heal his back completely in your name. Amen. So he smiled. He said, thank you. And he gave me my receipt and we trundled off with our shopping. So next time I'm in Tesco's, I'm going to find out how Chris's back is. There's a great verse in Matthew 10 that I always come back to when I'm thinking about declaring Jesus publicly. It's Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Whoever acknowledges me before the Father, says Jesus, before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. 
But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. You know, I sometimes think of that last day when I'm standing for Almighty God, the Father, and Jesus is there. And I'm wanting Jesus to turn to the Father and look at me and say, David, 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 he's one of mine. You know, to hear, to hear those words, every insult, every rejection, every difficulty will just be wiped away as nothing to hear that the Father and Jesus speaking my name. And I know you want that too. You know, on the last day, we want Jesus to own us, don't we? What an opportunity we have in this day to own Jesus to our friends, our work colleagues, our family, our neighbors this week and every week. Why don't we stand and let's respond to God? So let's just pray, just bow your heads in prayer. Whatever your job is, or whatever you're doing with your time, it's at least these three things for us as Christians. Opportunity to create amazing culture of integrity and compassion. It's an opportunity to serve others through sacrifice. And it's an opportunity to bring hope by declaring the greatest name of all, the name of Jesus. Just take a moment to reflect on whatever it is that God said to you this morning. Maybe you need to ask God for strength, for wisdom. Maybe he's put a colleague on your heart. Maybe it's a difficult work situation where you're going to have to bring some change. Whatever it is, Lord, we cry out to you and we thank you for your promise to work in us as we work. And we thank you for this promise of fruitfulness that you're releasing on your people now, Lord. We declare that, Lord, that you are a fruitful God. And Lord, as we step out into the city and into our workplaces and neighborhoods this week, we're believing you, Lord, that you will make us fruitful. And we thank you, God. We have this amazing message of hope that Jesus is Lord, and we want to speak your name now over every situation. Father, we thank you for your Son. Would you fill us with your Spirit in Jesus' name? Amen. Let's worship God.